Did you ever have the experience of doing something good for someone and then afterwards slightly regretting it? Like you're, you're driving along and um, you see a car pulling, wanting to get out onto the road or, and you let them out and then you see them kind of chuck, chuck, chuck and you go, oh, here we go. And you're going to be stuck behind this driver who doesn't really know what they're doing for who knows how long until the next exit. Or you're in Lidl or Aldi and you're shopping away and uh, you see a man with a little basket and you say, oh, sure, off you go, sir. Off you. I've only got a few, little, few things, little things myself. And he goes, oh, thank you very much. And then arrives his wife with the Christmas shopping I just trolley with, okay, everything and anything in it. Or more serious things, maybe you give your, 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 your car uh, on loan to someone and it comes back plastered and curry chips inside and smelling of garlic mayonnaise and wrappers all over the place or, or a wing mirror or a dent or something. And then someone gives you back the keys and goes, oh yeah, sorry, and, uh, and walks away. <laughs> or, or whatever it may be, whatever it may be. Could be anything, could be anything. Right, two as farmers as well, like I remember at home, we used to share uh, tractors and tools and machinery and all this kind of stuff. And you'd always hope, obviously, that you got it back in as good a condition as you gave it. At times you'd do someone a favor and yeah, it would backfire. And you'd say, well, that won't be happening again. You know, just that, that kind of a thing where you do something good for someone and it, 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 it backfires, as in, you end up, you're, you're after doing a favor, you're after uh, risking something or going out on a limb, and in return, you get nothing. <laughs> not that you're doing things to, to, not only do you get nothing, in, in return, you come out with less, right? So this is the kind of love, right, that God has for us. Uh, giving, forgiving, providing, knowing that so often what he gets in return is indifference, or yeah, fine, yeah, grand. Just kind of this, this uh, dismissive kind of a presumption. Ah, oh, yeah, sure, God will forgive me, just fine. Like, just no, no sense of kind of wonder or all that kind of fear we mentioned a couple of days ago. Um, a healthy kind of a fear before God, like who am I? Who am I before him? Who am I? So God gives even though he knows that, that we won't necessarily thank him or be grateful. We can imagine uh, when the Lord freed the people from their, the Jews from their slavery in Egypt. When they came out, it had been over 400 years uh, since the Jews arrived there. So uh, I suppose some of the Jewish practices were somewhat rusty. So when they were in the, the desert, God had to give them rules, laws, in order to preserve them, in order to, kind of, in order to help, them how, help them to pray, help them to know how to behave here. So we have the rest of the, of the, the, the Torah, right? you have Leviticus and you have Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers and Deuteronomy. All of these, the, these rules, not to enslave them again, you know, to go from one form of slavery to another form of slavery, but to show them how to live, show them how to pray, show them what was important, okay? And what's so kind of sad about it is then, unfortunately, uh, some of the Jews would have taken these rules and added all sorts of extra conditions to them and just really overcomplicated the thing. So much so that carrying your sleeping mat on the Sabbath day was considered, again, not by, div not by divine inspired law, uh, not, not from the Torah, but from the derivations of the law, that, that was considered work. So carrying your sleeping mat was considered work and therefore was considered a sin to do on the Sabbath. And then Jesus comes along and is like, that's, that's not what I... That's not what we meant. That's not what we meant at all, giving you the law that, that, that you can't carry your sleeping mat. Come on, a bit of cop on here. You know, like, they, just, they, they, they took the things too far and forgot about love. They, like, you know, the law is there to protect them, to help them, but never to get in the way of, of authentic, divine love. Let's keep in mind, how unfortunately, that word today, love, uh, can very easily be misunderstood because it's used for all sorts of things that have nothing to do with love. Divine love, as God wants it, as God wants us to live love. The law was actually getting in the way of it rather than protecting it. So the Lord wants to free us. And he will give, even though as we see, especially in the Old Testament, so, so, so often, he 
gives and he forgives and he establishes a covenant and then <clears throat> the people walk away, the people choose another idol, the people choose to, to grumble against God and complain and take him for granted. It just happens over and over and over again. <clears throat> but it doesn't stop the Lord. Why? Because he is love. So he will not give up on us. He will not give up on us. And in our gospel today, he, he, he does something which we might consider strange or unusual. So obviously, back in these days, uh, there weren't hospitals. It's very important to kind of try and understand a little what the, the context of, of these gospels is like. There weren't hospitals for the public. There weren't schools for the public. There was private tuition for the rich, and there were doctors who would visit the homes, usually of the rich, right? Because they could afford it. So the poor people, the sick, would sit on the streets and beg. There was no social services. So that's why Jesus so often meets the, the poor, the sick, the lame, on the streets. Jesus never visits a hospital because there weren't any. Okay, that, that came about with Christianity afterwards. Okay, so here we have this place called Beth, Beth, uh, Bethsata, <clears throat> with five porticos and all these uh, blind, lame, paralyzed people just, just between begging and waiting for this uh, kind of miraculous event uh, in the water where they could be uh, let into it and, and hopefully cured. That was, their, that was their hope. So this man had been suffering for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there, he knew that he had been in this condition for a long time. He said to him, do you want to be well again? Do you want to? Wait, hang on now. The man has been sick for 38 years and has been waiting there for healing, apparently. We hope, we think, we presume. For 38 years. And Jesus asks him, do you want to be well again? This isn't the first time. Jesus asks elsewhere, like if there's a blind man that comes to him. Again, it would have been fairly obvious. The man would be blind. He'd be kind of, you know, you have to obviously with a stick kind of feel his way around the place and he wouldn't be looking at you straight in the eye because he doesn't know exactly where your eyes are. Uh, so you could tell, right? And Jesus asks him, what do you want me to do for you? Again, you'd imagine it's fairly obvious, like, you know. What do you want me to do for you? Lord, that I may see. Okay, so why does Jesus do this? Why does Jesus ask what's, what's, what we, one might consider really obvious? There is an interesting phenomenon amongst, uh, in, in our minds are complicated things, or they really are. There's an awful lot going on up here, or in here, wherever your mind is. Uh, uh, there's an awful lot going on, and it can happen. That when a person is used to a certain cross, used to being sick, they can actually find it difficult to let go of it. It's, it's something that, that we, we come across a bit in kind of healing ministry or even, even in youth ministry. That you get, you get used to being maybe the victim, for example. You know, you had a, a, a tough upbringing, um, you know, difficulties in, in the family and all of that. Um, parents, brothers, sisters, whatever it may have been, right? And, and then when it comes to, to you know, bring this to the Lord here, it can happen, even young people, that they don't know how to let go of this hurt or wound because they think, Jenny, this has been, this has really, this has defined, to myself, this has defined me for so long. You know, I'm the one who was forgotten. I'm the one who was left out. I'm the one who wasn't good enough. And now as the Lord starts to reveal, no, you are good enough, and yes, you are loved, to let go of these kind of old thoughts and, and self-definitions, ways of seeing oneself, can actually be hard. Go, well, hang on, if I'm not the, if I'm not the victim, well, well, who am I? Cause that, that I understand, that, that I'm familiar with. I'm, I'm used to being there, that I get. But if I'm, if I'm not that, well, then what am I? It's a strange kind of idea, but... This happens, you know. Um, I, I, I know a couple of people like who, it doesn't matter how much healing they get, they actually don't really want to be well. They don't really want to be well because in their own heads, they are the sick one. And so it doesn't matter what healing they get or everything, they'll always, there'll be something, there'll always be something wrong. There'll be something wrong, you know what I mean? Uh, and, and, and if there isn't something wrong, they, they'll make something wrong. You know, they, they, they find it hard to let go of being sick. 
And this can happen, I think, in all sorts of situations as well, uh, where we, we, we get stuck. We get stuck in, in a certain event of our past or in a certain, as I say, vision of ourselves, understanding of ourselves. Uh, and don't get me wrong, these things that happened were awful, were terrible, were difficult. Um, we don't just kind of say, ah, look, get over it, pray a rosary, you'll be fine. That's not what we're saying at all. But, but if you stay here, if you stay here in this memory of the past and this wound of the past, this hurt of the past, that means that your present here keeps getting dragged back. And so you're, you're never actually here. You're never actually present. You're always back there in that, that place of pain, that hurt, and that place of woundedness, that place of, of, of illness, whatever it may be. And so you, you can't move on. So we have this, this interesting and necessary step to take of learning how to recognize what has happened in the past, ask for forgiveness if we did anything in, in, in these memories that, that you know, if, if we fell into addiction because of that we caused hurt, okay, then I have to ask forgiveness. We forgive others, or if it's a question of healing, that I give this illness to the Lord and say, Lord, whatever, whatever, whatever your will is, Lord, I accept. If you want me to be, to be well, I will be well. If you want me to carry this cross, I'll carry this cross. So we, we, we reconcile with the past and then move on with the present. Move on with, with today, with now, with now. So you're not burying it, you're not ignoring it, but it doesn't define you. It's, it's not all of you. You know, St. John Paul II was so clear as, as well. We are not, uh, how did he phrase it? We're not just a collection of our own sins and experiences. We're not just a collection of our own sins and failures. We're far more than that. Your identity is that you are a child of God. So when the Lord asks you, and you may do so in the context of a mass or an adoration or who knows what, do you want to be well? Again, it's, it's, it's not an obvious question. Do you want to be well again? Do you want to be well again? If you had no illness, would you know who you are? Or does your illness define you in your own head? I'm, oh, I'm always the one who has to be. I'm, I've got some sort of a sickness or an illness. And, you know, it's just a, you know, when I meet people, then that's what I talk about. Oh, bless us and save us. You know, my, 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 my lower abdominal, who knows what. You know, and, and the whole thing comes, right? <laughs> Is that what defines me? Or am I able to say, thank God, everything's great. And be happy saying that. Am I actually able to let go? And in my own mind then, when I'm sitting in the silence before the Lord, wherever that may be, if you're at home, maybe it might be in your living room, I'm sitting in silence, does my mind tend to always kind of drag back to those things of the past that, that hurt me? And, and it becomes, as I say, strangely familiar. That, that's, that's where I know how to live there. That's, I'm used to it. Or is fear of actually moving on stopping the Lord from healing me? Fear of being well. Fear of being healed. Do you want to be well again? Do you want to be well again? Sir replied the sick man, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is disturbed. And while I'm still on the way, someone else gets there before me. Jesus said, Get up, pick up your sleeping mat, and walk. And the man was cured at once, and picked up his mat, and walked away. This is what the Lord can do for you. Do you want to be well again? Do you want to be healed? Do you want to let go of your pains, hurts, wounds, your past, your illnesses? And it may be, as I say, it's not that all illnesses is caused by us holding on to it. It may be, of course, that the Lord, in his wisdom, wants us to carry this for a while, whatever that illness may be. But if the Lord wants to heal you, let yourself be healed. <laughs>